the red book in the pew in front of you uh, on page 355. Blessed be God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And blessed be his kingdom now and forever. Amen. Please join me in saying the collect for purity at the bottom of the page. Almighty God, God to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hidden. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthy magnify of your holy name. Through Christ our Lord. Amen.
fountain of all wisdom. You know our necessities before we ask and our ignorance in asking. Have compassion on our weakness and mercifully give those things for which on our unworthiness we dare not and for our blindness we cannot ask. Through the worthiness of your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Please be seated for the word of God. Our first lesson is a reading from the book of Genesis. Jacob's dream, the ladder, and the promised land. Jacob left Beersheba and went to Haran. He came to a certain place and stayed there for the night, because the sun had set. Taking one of the stones of the place, he put it under his head and lay down in that place. And he dreamed that there was a ladder set up on the earth, and the top of it reaching to heaven. And the angels of God were ascending and descending on it. And the Lord stood beside him and said, I am the Lord the God of Abraham your father, and the God of Isaac. The land on which you lie I will give to you and to your offspring, and your offspring shall be like the dust of the earth, and ye shall spread abroad to the west, and to the east, and to the north, and to the south. And all the families of the earth shall be blessed in you and in your offspring. Know that I am with you, and will keep you wherever you go, and will bring you back to this land. For I will not leave you until I have done what I have promised to you. Then Jacob woke from his sleep and said, Surely the Lord is in this place, and I did not know it. And he was afraid and said, How awesome is this place! This is none other than the house of God, and this is the gate of heaven. So Jacob rose early in the morning, and he took the stone that he had put under his head and set it up for a pillar and poured, poured oil on top of it. He called that place Bethel, the word of the Lord. Thanks to God. Our response reading today, in place of our song, is the wisdom of Solomon. There is no God beside you, whose care is for all people, to whom you should prove that you have not judged unjustly. For your strength is the source of righteousness, and your sovereignty over all causes you to spare all. For you show your strength when people doubt the completeness of your power, and you rebuke any insolence among those who know it. Although you are sovereign in strength, you judge with mildness, and with great forbearance you govern us. For you have power to act whenever you choose. Through such works you have taught your people that the righteous must be kind, and you have filled your children with good hope because you give repentance for sins. Our second reading, The Spirit Bears Witness, a reading from the letter to the Romans. Brothers and sisters, we are debtors, not to the flesh, to live according to the flesh. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. For all who are led by the Spirit of God are children of God. For you did not receive a spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received a spirit of adoption. When we cry, Abba, Father, it is that very Spirit bearing witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ, if in fact we suffer with Him so that we may also be glorified with Him. <coughs> I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory about to be revealed to us. For the creation waits eager, longing for the revealing of the children of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, not of its own will, but by the will of the one who subjected it, in hope that creation itself will be set free from its bondage to decay, and will obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. We know that the whole creation has been groaning in labor pains until now. And not only the creation, but we ourselves, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, groan inwardly while we wait for adoption, the redemption of our bodies. 
For in hope we were saved. Now hope that is seen is not hope. For who hopes for what is seen? But if we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it with patience. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. blessing we come together to seek your word, to hear it, to place it deep in our hearts, and to be faithful in the practice of seeking you in our lives. Help us, Lord. Be with us in that endeavor. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. So I, I, I heard something uh, in that reading, that very first reading about Jacob, um, that he, uh, you know, and you, and you hear the story so often that it just kind of gets in your head and you don't think about it. Um, but he, he goes until he's exhausted and he's got nowhere to stay. Apparently he doesn't have a tent, doesn't have a blanket or a pillow or anything like that. And so he puts his head on a stone. And so he's lying in this stony, rocky kind of a place. I don't know about any of you, have you ever been camping and slept like without a camp mattress uh, or, a, or, or a sleeping bag kind of a thing and you're laying on stones and the next morning you wake up and there's a root in your back and you know maybe your head was on a stone or something like that. Um, I, if, if you haven't had that experience, I haven't. I have to tell you, it's kind of uncomfortable and to wake up and say, the Lord was in this place and I did not know it <laughs> because of his vision uh, of, of the ladder of angels going up and down 
was would be kind of a revelation that you might not have after a night like that. Uh, there was certainly this place uh, when I was in the Diocese of Western Massachusetts, there was a retreat house where the clergy would go uh, on one of our, we, we would go to two different places, but on one of our, um, one of our retreats, we would go to this retreat house and the beds were like, I mean, rocks. After, after the first time that you went there, after my very first night when I went there, and, they, and the other clergy wouldn't tell you, you know. Uh, I, I went out to the REI and I got a, you know, a thin little camp mattress so that I could like, like wake up and have my hips move uh, the next day. Um, but that place was so holy and so filled with prayer. It was a convent. It was so filled with prayer and the, the kindness and the beauty of the sisters and the work that they did in the world that we went back year after year after year and everybody just took their little camp mattress with them uh, to put on top of the bed. Uh, because we knew that the money that they saved on those mattresses was going back into the world to take care of people in the world. And so uh, you wake up and in that kind of a place you say, God is in this, in this moment, in this place, in this waking that I have. And I did not know it when I was laying there complaining and grumbling about the hardness of the mattress the first night. Um, so I've had that experience. And then we look at the gospel. And, and everybody focuses on one thing. Again, who, who wants to tell me what you probably focused on? Anybody? What's in that gospel? Furnace of fire? Weeping and gnashing of teeth? Yeah? Uh, there, are, there are scary things in there that we might dwell on. But what we need to remember, uh, and we always need to remember this, that, that God judges us with love and compassion. We heard it in the Wisdom of Solomon. We heard it in the reading uh, about Jacob. And we hear it in the Gospel because Jesus said so. Uh, but while he judges us with love and compassion and kindness, uh, as we heard in the Wisdom of Solomon, uh, and we have many, many opportunities to live a faithful, just, and merciful life, which is what we're being judged on. Are we faithful? Are we merciful? Are we compassionate? Are we kind? These are the things you get judged on. None of the other stuff matters if you do these things. I mean, they may matter if you hurt somebody, but if you uh, are compassionate and kind, you're not going to do that, right? Um, but we are judged. And Jesus says so, uh, that we are judged and that people who have ignored all of the chances that we have to live a compassionate and just uh, and merciful life uh, will be judged at the end of the kingdom and there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth and he says that four times in Matthew's gospel four different times he wants to make sure we hear that and every, after every time he says let anyone with ears listen hear this so the first time we heard it was in Matthew 8 when he was astonished and happy about the fullness of the faith of the centurion who wasn't even one of the children of Abraham, and he expressed disappointment in those who claimed to be the faithful, who claimed to be part of the kingdom of God, who only gave lip service to their faith and showed up just to be seen, and who in their lives assumed superiority over other people that they deemed less worthy, like the centurion. Okay? Today's reading is the second instance in Matthew where he does that, and he makes it clear that we can grow into lives of spiritual health, we can be the good seed, or we can attach ourselves to death. And I'll talk about that a little bit more in a moment. Because the, the seed can is, is indistinguishable. Are you living a life that will change and that will moderate where you are working on yourself throughout your life? I don't care how young or old you are, as long as you're working on yourself, you can, at the harvest, be pulled in as the good seed, as the wheat, in this case. The third instance is in Matthew 24, in the parable of the wicked servant, a person who is put in charge of his fellow servants because uh, the owner of the house said, oh, well, you're doing such a good job, I'm going to put you in charge of everybody. But instead of being a good steward of that position, he starts beating 
the other servants and starving them so that he could live it up and privileged himself above, the, above others. Not compassionate, not merciful, not kind. Uh, and then finally, in Matthew 25, he says, weeping and gnashing of teeth again, uh, when he tells the parable of the talents, where four servants are given the opportunity to grow the landowner's holdings, but one does nothing. And when he's called out about it, he puts the blame on the person who gave him something to grow. And he says, oh, no, you're bad, and, and I knew you'd be bad, so I just hid it. But no, that's sour grapes. He was jealous of the others who got a little more than him. And so he was petulant, possibly, and put that money aside and hid it. And then when he got called out on it, when he got caught, just giving back what he did, uh, he put the blame somewhere else. So another instance of someone privileging themselves or their own opinion of how the world works above the good of all. So he should have done something from the what he was given from the generous sower, even though it was a very little. And so in every single one of these instances, there's a definite point during the parable or the story where Jesus makes it clear that a major contributor to an unhealthy spiritual path is forgetting that the one who judges between the wheat and the weeds is God. And God knows what is in your heart, why you do the things that you do, and whether you are looking at others with kindness and compassion or whether you're looking at others with disdain and only showing on the outside a pretense of kindness and compassion. And only God can judge because only God knows our hearts. In all of these stories, people, whether they're disciples or religious leaders or simply characters within the parables who believe that they have a right to judge the lives of the others, are not only the focus of the parable, but they are the reason he tells it. He sees this going on around him, and so he tells the parable to make people wake up and pay attention to what they are doing and how they were harming themselves and others. But Jesus and uh, others of God's chosen leaders, like in the Wisdom of Solomon, point out that though it is a dangerous road to try to take God's place as the judge of other people's lives, God still, even so, judges us with compassion and love, and we have all the way into the end of the age. So that means even after we die, we have the opportunity to make it right. I never really noticed that before. Because the reapers are the angels. And they can only, harvesters, not the reapers, the harvesters are the angels. They can only bring in that harvest uh, uh, afterwards. Afterwards, right? So when we presume God's role as judge and jury of others' lives, and start ripping out what we assume are weeds. We are living in a dangerous and detrimental place in our lives. And I'm not talking about the kind of judging where uh, it's a criminal case or something like that that we do. I mean, God even appointed judges, Ruth and Boaz, you know, some of these other people were judges uh, in the thing to help solve issues between people fairly and compassionately. Uh, and I'm not talking about judging a situation where your life might be in danger or something detrimental might happen to you or family if you do this thing. I'm talking about judging other people unfairly, unkindly, and unknowingly because you are not God. The parable of the wheat and the weeds, today's parable, exists in a series of teaching about that kind of behavior. <laughs> Uh, and it began with the parable of the sower that we heard last week about generosity, um, connected to goodness and to our place in helping spread the good news, where we are to abundantly sow the goodness and the love of God. And that continues in this because the weeds and the wheat, it's okay, well, okay, so somebody came in and messed this up, or you think somebody came in and messed this up, well, just leave it. Just leave it. You don't know which are the weeds and which are the wheat. 
at this time. So let, let's just leave it because uh, maybe what you think is a weed is actually good seed. The sower does no tiny rows, has no concerns about grains that fall among the rocks or the thorns, just faith that the seed will grow and spread itself into an abundant harvest. Same thing with this owner of the land. And between that parable of the sower and today's parable is the parable of the mustard seed. Okay, so another thing about judging something to be a weed when in all actuality it is a thing of goodness. So how many of you like mustard? Show of hands. Can you imagine having a hot dog without mustard today? So back in the day when Jesus was telling this, you know, mustard was not something that, uh, it was just so, it was weed, it was be, to be pulled up and torn out, but today it's a cash crop. Oh my goodness, it's a really good thing. Um, so that was about an unloved seed in one era that uh, God knew would be sought after to give flavor and goodness to the world uh, in another era. So in today's parable, uh, the word that we see translated as weeds is actually a plant that was called in that day darnel, okay, which is a wheat-like plant. It's in the rye family, and you can't really tell it apart until it's all the way grown up and has its seeds and has the, uh, uh, what you would use to make bread. And in that world, there were so many people that were in agricultural, because everybody grew their own wheat to make their own bread, that they understood what Darnell was. And so when Jesus said the, the wheat and the Darnell, they were going, oh, that's what got planted in there. Okay. Because knowing that it was Darnell would help them to understand the parable a little better, even if they didn't get Jesus' explanation. Because Darnell is subject to a, a, a fungus that you can't see that grows inside that can infect bread that might be made with it or other products or when you are doing it, if you ingest it, you can get so sick that you can die from it. And before you die, you stagger it around drunkenly, uh, which is part of the name behind it. And so knowing that Darnell was something that could bring death, no wonder the, the, uh, the servants wanted to pull that stuff up as soon as possible. But, the, the, um, but God said, no, don't do that because you don't know which is which and you're going to kill the wheat. So um, remember me mentioning the parable was about spiritual health and spiritual death. So that's how Jesus works that in with the dark. <laughs> uh, Jesus is talking about people, though, not plants. How each of us has the potential to grow both good seed and weeds in our hearts. He gets into that when he talks about it. The grain of goodness is that life-giving grain, that life-giving things that we all do in our family or community. And the grain that is infected by a fungus is, the, is that those things that we do that can harm our families or our community by our behavior. Uh, the problem is that evil and the evil one often masks itself in what we might think is good. So we may think that we're doing something good or that we're on the side of good when all actuality or we are we are we have been infected. We have been infected by ignorance or zeal. Uh, and we what we imagine are weeds may actually be God's good harvest that we could destroy through our actions or choke out. And then we become the thorns that choke out the seedlings. The question Jesus offers us in these parables and in all this kind of convoluted thinking <laughs> um, seems to be, who is willing to trust the harvest to be God's abundant sowing? Who is willing to trust that growing up, that thing that you think is a weed might become the good weed? Rather than jumping in and destroying it because we think that we are God and we can judge what is we and what is good. It's a lot to take in. I know that. It's a lot about not trying to be God, but trying to be a servant of God. Of not judging one another unless we judge as God judges with compassion and mercy and kindness. Um, 
and trusting that God has it. God has us. And that all will be well. Amen. I want you to please stand now and turn to page 358 in the Book of Common Prayer. And let's affirm our faith in the one living God uh, through the message. We believe in one God, the Father. Bodies and hearts ache. 
We ask for healing for all who suffer. We especially pray for Melchore Thomas, T Tomas, Margaret Hale, Jim and Connie Virgin, Phoebe and Jim Rubemore, Patrice Luther, Jim Wallace, Ann Allen, Kathleen Buchanan, Barbara Ackery, Katie Rubemore, Marie and Don Trike, Bob Monte, Sandy Rabb, Russell Johnson, Jim Currow, Mitch Gillespie, Ricky Hart, Chris Tipton, Amanda Cook, Jim Haney, Joy, Reese Smith, Nancy Long, Charles Foreman, and all those who in this transitory life are in sorrow, trouble, sorrow, need, sickness, or any other adversity. For this, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, Lord have mercy. Thank you to the Goodsons, I, I think, for preparing a coffee area. <laughs> um, uh, uh, so we will have coffee hour down at the church. And at that coffee hour, uh, after we get our food and stuff like that, Mark Goodson, Mark, wave your hand, is going to explain Realm, which is our new communications and financial software and things like that, so that you can understand how to use it, how to put the app on your phone. and. Um, and see your stuff and see other people uh, uh, that belong to the church uh, that you only have access to and they only have access to to be able to send your Christmas cards and all that kind of stuff out. The vestry did vote to uh, get uh, the smallest number of texts, which is like 400 texts a month. And since we would only send one to a family, 
Uh, we can do that like a bunch of times a month. Um, and we will use that uh, if we have a tornado. I don't think we'll ever have snow again. But if we have some reason. <laughs> don't, don't say that. <laughs> yeah. Uh, <laughs> if, if for some reason we need to say, come to church on Zoom today, uh, you'll get a text uh, telling you that or an email. So, uh, And for those of you who are not going to be able to use Realm because you don't do email or text, uh, someone who will call you, so uh, don't worry about that. But uh, Mark is going to explain how to do that. And if you got the message uh, inviting you to come and, and brought your laptop or your smartphone or something like that, we'll even sit with you and help you kind of see how that works. Or I will. Mark is looking at me like, what? I didn't say that. <laughs> uh, uh, the other thing is just a reminder that the Daughters of the King now have a prayer request box. It's in this little alcove right here, the smaller narthex entrance area, uh, where you can date and put your prayer need, and the date helps us because they'll pray for that for a couple of months, uh, and then they'll contact you to see uh, if you want to do that. It can be confidential, or it can go in the prayers of the people, which we just had, um, and it can in even include, do I want the priest to call me um, and kind of help me through this? Uh, so all of that is there, and so those cards are there, and they are back there behind Lisa. And then I have this because, as a reminder, we are collecting for the Backpack Initiative. Last year, they had, what's the number on there, like 893 Eight, kids. Almost 900. Almost 900 kids that, uh, that needed help with their school supplies. And so we are collecting for that over the next month or so. Um, and you will see this basket go up and down the aisles, but it will also be back there at the usher station uh, for you when you come in if you don't want to hold, you know, like Laura brought in these backpacks today, she probably didn't want to sit with them. I don't blame her. Um, so we will be doing that uh, as well. And uh, if you don't know it yet, uh, it, we said so, I think, I think it's just in the vestry minutes. But we decided to stop paying for a post office box. The rates keep going up and up, and it's like $125 or $119 or something every six months. And so we got a mailbox and attached it to the building. Uh, and so our new mailing address, if you happen to be one of those people that does bank, send the check to the, send my pledge to the church, uh, you need to change the address. And our address is on the front of your bulletin. It's 339 South Main Street. So uh, dude, that's the address of the parish house. So you'll need to go in and make sure that that gets changed. Uh, and if you want to send us a Christmas card when it's time, that'll be the new address. So uh, that's already started. And I know that they'll forward it for about six months. But um, at some point, you'll, you'll get that, you'll get that uh, card back to you that says, at the, this, not at this address anymore. <laughs> right, so are there other announcements? Yes, Lisa. At the behest of Karen Rockmore, I had Amanda make a sign-up sheet for Mount Glory. So if you can come and help set up and take down or work during the day, please add your name. Okay. If you're new to the church, we always do a bake sale for yes, Mount Glory. I'm always grateful for everyone that bakes, but last year three of us took everything down, and we're not, we're getting older, and we need help, so I'm, I'm not willing to have three people take it down, we can't have help taking it down, we just need to think about it. Um, so show up and help take that down? Yeah, we have, we we have workers stuff. in the morning, because they want us off the street, so people swarm us and help us get yeah. set up. Um, but when we're trying to get get it taken down, you know, Gail parks her truck down on Fourth Street Hill on one of those hills, and we're carrying tables and all that stuff down the hill to the car. Yeah. What what time does that occur? It it ended at five last year, and we didn't have hardly anything left. So five o'clock is when we did. Four thirty. Four thirty. You show up at four four thirty. Yep. Show so up. So people just think about that. You can't make if you got some you know arms and yeah. legs that. Free parking at the church. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, yeah, thank you, Karen. That's, that's important. We don't think about that. We think about getting our goods there, but not the, uh, the people that have been there all day. And, uh, 
maybe are not ready to carry a table. The tables are light, but it's, it's a long, it's a height. The tents, like I'm not tall enough to, oh, to pull that cover off. I too am high challenged, yes. I understand that. Okay, anything else for the good of the community? All right. Um, oh yeah. Birthdays, anniversary. So it's Amanda Tippy's birthday and Jim and Amanda's uh, anniversary. So we're going to turn to the. Somebody else's birthday. Huh? Wasn't there two birthdays at the list? Yep. Jim Haney. Jim Haney, yeah, he's here. That's right, Jim Haney. Oh my goodness, that's right. Last year we went to Jim Haney's birthday party. So, so the two channels would stand. Jim, you can stand for Amanda.
good and joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, through Jesus Christ our Lord, who on the first day of the week overcame death and the grave, and by his glorious resurrection opened to us the way of everlasting life. Therefore, we praise you, joining our voices with angels and archangels, and with all the company of heaven who forever sing this hymn to proclaim the glory of your name. subject to evil and death, you in your mercy sent Jesus Christ, your only and eternal Son, to share our human nature, to live and die as one of us, to reconcile us to you, the God and Father of all. He stretched out his arms upon the cross and offered himself in obedience to your will, a perfect sacrifice for the whole world. On the night he was handed over to suffering and death, our Lord Jesus Christ took bread. And when he had given thanks to you, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. After supper, he took the cup of wine. And when he had given thanks, he gave it to them and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sin. Whenever you drink it, do this for the remembrance of me. Therefore, we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. We celebrate the memorial of our redemption, O Father, in this sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving. Recalling his death, resurrection, and ascension, we offer you these gifts. Sanctify them by your Holy Spirit to be for your people the body and blood of your Son, the holy food and drink of you and unending life in him. Sanctify us also that we may faithfully receive this holy sacrament and serve you in unity, constancy, and peace. And at the last day, bring us with all your saints into the joy of your eternal kingdom. All this we ask through your Son, Jesus Christ, by him and with him and in him, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. Amen. And now, as our Savior has taught us, we are bold to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom. for us. Therefore, let us keep the feast. Hallelujah. Lamb of God, you 
take away the sins of the world, have mercy on us. Lamb of God, you take away the sins of the world, have mercy on us. Lamb of God, you take away the sins of the world, grant us your peace. These are God's holy gifts for God's holy people. Take them in remembrance that Christ came because God loves you, loves the whole world, sees you as worthy, and invites you to this table.
today, let's say the prayer on page 366. Almighty and ever living God, we thank you for feeding us with the spiritual food of the most precious body and blood of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, and for assuring us in these holy mysteries that we are living members of the body of your Son and heirs of your eternal kingdom. And now, Father, send us out to do the work you have given us to do, to love and serve you as faithful witnesses of Christ our Lord. To him, to you, and to the Holy Spirit, be honor and glory, now and forever. Amen. May God bless you with discomfort and easy answers, half-truths, and superficial relationships, so that you may live deep within your heart. May God bless you with anger and injustice, oppression, and exploitation of people so that you may work for justice, freedom, and peace. May God bless you with tears to shed for those who suffer from pain, rejection, starvation, and war so that you may reach out your hand to comfort them and turn their pain into joy. And may God bless you with enough foolishness to believe that you can make a difference in this world so that you can do what others claim cannot be done. And the blessing of God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be among you and go with you always. Amen. Amen.
Thursday.
change. 